Thank you. Oh, good on you. Welcome, everyone. This is a great forum today, and uh, I'd better use this as soon as I'm hanging on to it. Excellent forum. I've got heaps out of it. I hope I can add just a little bit. So I'm an agronomist from northern New South Wales. I've been having a crack at agronomy for 23 years with roles in rain-fed and irrigated horticulture, broadacre cropping and pasture systems. However, I've been involved, like a lot of us, in weed control for over 40 years, having started on our black soil property near Inverell, pulling mint weed and darling pea by hand and cursing the saffron thistles as I hurtled over them chasing stock. There we go. There we go. Thanks for the opportunity to share some of my experience in weed control with particular reference to resistant weed management. It seems a few extra years and a couple of grey hairs qualifies you to make the opportunity up here to reflect and share some thoughts with the hope of helping others. Please indulge me as I chew the cud over weed control and give some details of our current activities. So just a quick overview there, I'll, I'll give you a historical summary. The rise of resistance, you've seen a bit of that from Drew and Longy already, so I won't uh, labour that one. A bit of our cropping system, key weeds and resistance status, current efforts, and a little bit of a look to the future as well. Right, I, I look at the oldest book I had on the shelf. Back in the Garden of Eden, young Cain was the first full-time serious farmer dealing with weeds. Now, my dad's not uh, quite as old as Methuselah, but he was ag science trained, but in an era before herbicides as we know them. The emphasis then was on accurate botanical classification, Latin names, thank the Lord we didn't have to learn too many of those, and cultural and mechanical methods of weed control. These lessons are still very relevant today. Certainly in the last 30 to 50 years, we've seen the development and increased use of a plethora of herbicides. My agronomy career has spanned the birthday era of herbicides where thanks to the hard work and financial investment of a burgeoning group of chemical companies, a new product or active group of herbicide was presented to us each year to make our life easier. All we had to do was open the card, read the label, unwrap the palette, start exploring all of its wonderful uses and applications, all within the label constraints, of course. And I thank my learned colleagues for not laughing at me there. We followed the label guidance and from experience found the rates, weather conditions, adjuvants, thank you Andrew Somervale, the mixing partners, the droplet size and the timing that suited each product best. In fact, we reckon we were pretty well cracking along well with a lot of those products. Um, the gun agros were nailing them, they were passing around the information to each other and then that sour smell of resistance blew in. During that period though, we made some sensational gains in productivity, uh, not just by herbicide use, but in conjunction with changes in the farming system, they allowed, particularly zero-till. Were we a bit too clever at times? I suspect so. Did underdosing of expensive products and repeated use of the one active really pave the way for best practice resistance management for Group A herbicides? I suspect not. Are there still opportunities to preserve and steward our current actives? Very definitely yes, and to even breathe new life into old ones with judicious use. Righto, the rise of resistant populations. We've had a few different funny pictures today about how it turned up and belted us in the back of the head. You've probably read that, that joke before. It was getting get bigger and bigger and then it hit me. That was a classic photo the other day. A magpie zooming in. So that's about the graph we've all been, all been dealing with since way back. Just left high school there. Good timing. Into it. Rightio. Today we're faced with well documented single active and multiple active resistant weeds, a much reduced offering of new chemical products to explore, and a changing brains trust leading the charge in weed control strategies. We're not so much customers and users now. We are practitioners and managers of multiple facets of weed control. The people leading the charge are less likely to be reps or techos of the ever aggregating chemical companies, but more the NGAs or the goers or the RE Weed Smart, and in our grower's case, AMPS Research as well. We're refining use patterns, finding new uses for existing actives or their mixes. 
Of course, the industry continues to be blessed by notable servants with the smarts, such as Richard Daniels, Maka, Chris Peston, Preston, Peter Butzalis, Andrew Somerville, Chris Love, Matty Gardner, Barry Haskins, and lots of other people that we're learning from today. And at the same time, great value is coming to the industry from innovative farmers, like Warwick who just spoke and others here today, as it always has, as they ponder, tinker, and invent new ways, new machines for the benefit of all. Although that was the preamble I dreamt up at three o'clock one morning about a month ago. I thought that just came into the head. I thought I'd sit up and type that. Here we go, this is what really happens at our place. This is probably any oats population you wanted to grab in the last five to sort of 12 years. Uh, black oats or wild oats. 20% uh, verdict, you'll see another one later that's a bit higher, but 100% topic resistant. Actual already at 65. I think this was 2012 or something. Select already, warning signs there. Thankfully we still had a group B that would work on that population. And of course we had these little suckers. I don't know, which one of you blokes from down south flew over and dropped these in our waterways and creek lines and fence lines? This, uh, this was a cracker. That got to be a, a patch of about 20-30 mm, hectares and scattered across a hundred before I picked up the farm and really got stuck in and thankfully this photo was last year so we're not completely out of the woods but thankfully we've put a, a big lid on that population. Uh, I'll let you do the reading there, some pretty ugly numbers up there, still a couple across some different groups here as well that, that made that a pretty fancy one to manage. Um, we had a wheat crop was where we really got serious about this ryegrass. We put uh, Sakura and Avidex down and incorporated it prior to planting. We used Atlantis in crop. Uh, where are we? Even though it was at 55%, we really didn't have a lot of options. We planted a really thick uh, crop. It was on 13-inch uh, rows, which is skinny for us. Sorry, guys. That's 15s, like, you know, 20s wide, 13. We do have a few of the John Deere units running at 7 or 12 inches, so that's something we'll take home from today and have a look at. Really hard to kill, and, and even with paraquat. Um, and that farm just happens to have, of course, you know, resistant linseed and barnyard grass as well. This is our cropping mix. So we farm moisture. Uh, we crop when we've got something going on that we, can, we reckon we can make our 300 to $500 a hectare profit out of gross margin anyway. Uh, wheat, durum wheat, uh, barley, chickies, etc. There's a photo of Jace, he's in the group, he went down to Wagga last year. Um, great looking crop of canola. And this year that's the only candidate under a pivot, that's about the only crop we've got in the district. No, there's a few but they're not real flash. Uh, in our summertime we do crop twice a year. Someone was telling me the other day that was a great advantage, at least we can have another crack. In some ways, you know, we're going to spend a whole heap of money again probably having a crack at a summer crop and maybe not come any, out any better. So we've just got to be really careful with the options that we do have. But it does give us the chance to get away from a winter system to clean up some oats. In other words, in, the, in that winter fallow, if it rains enough to get them out of the ground to get sprayed. East to the highway we've got some farms in a three year rotation, west it's more like five, maybe seven years, so the summer cropping frequency is pretty light. Uh, drew through this one up before, our uh, fallow and in-crop weed control measures are now an overlapping complexity of residuals, rotations, changes and then reassessments. If farming is the equivalent of an open air casino, Weed control using residuals in a multiple crop rotation is like playing chess with the rules changing all the time. We use the rotation of crops to help deal with resistant weeds, nematodes, crown rot, a whole lot of other issues. But it is a challenge. Our key resistant weeds, and I've just added a few more today, thanks guys. Um, but we've been dealing with wild oats with group A resistance for probably 20 years. Uh, Phalaris has snuck up in that group as well and, and with a bit of group B from the old glean days. We've got that, those patches of rye grass and, uh, that we're dealing with come off waterways and off fence lines but we've seen a fair bit of hay coming up the road lately and we're just wondering where that's all going to turn up next. Um, 
Hornless Barnyard Grass, full credit to Drew and Gary for kicking that off for us in the district, but it was coming everywhere and within a couple of years, as long as he said, we just don't test anymore, we, we do a spray, it's not dead, we, we carry on as though we've got resistance everywhere in our barnyard grass pretty well. And I concur that first spring spray is extremely important. We've got milk thistle populations that are starting to tick up over that 5-10% uh, glyphosate resistance. Righto. Other challenging weeds, and they are included in that resistant list now, would be feathertop roads, uh, fleabane and windmill grass. I forgot to put on that slide. That little bit of feathertop's actually been biologically controlled. Anyone seen the uh, Rutherglen bugs that come out of canola or linseed sometimes at harvest time? Suck the guts out of that one. It's a shame we can't harness it. We usually have them killing a crop next door, not so much the weeds. Fairly typical, you know, a barnyard that's been hit or grazed, hard to kill. Flea bone that's buckled and thickened up with a bit of group eye, but still, you know, having a crack on the next rain event. That's, uh, that's our lot in life. Now I've lost my place. Righto, so in our program, all aiming to try and stop seed set in the end uh, at harvest time, we're We've been away from residuals with our zero-till disc system. So we've been on that for probably 15 years and uh, we're, we're having to come back and review them. We've had some good input from Stan and a few others uh, just on, on how we're going to do that. So we're revisiting. NGA's done work for us as well with Trefland and Avidex. We've looked at some of the South Australian work with different planting techniques, just trying to throw some enough cover on those products to make them work. Sakura and Boxer Gold, we've, we've, we've done some work with them, we need to do some more. It's critical, talking to our blokes about buying hay baler if we can't work out how to use these uh, residual herbicides. No one wants to own a hay baler up our way, although this year would have been handy if you had something to bale. And then our in-crop, uh, we've really had to go away from Group A's in wheat. We, we can use Group B's there, so we do, to try and keep our rotation of herbicides going. Uh, we've got a couple of clear field options now, although we're starting to worry about how many immies we're throwing into the system with our fallows as well as in-crop. Um, we've also, as I said before, got Group B uh, resistance developing. Our pulses are really hanging on by a thread. Our verdict's not working, our clethidin's not working. For the last six, seven years we've been able to squeeze a job out of verdict and select together. Um, We've just had flam prop registered again in chickpeas, but probably not with the crop timing that we were really looking for as a tidy up. You saw some photos of Drew's earlier with the Madivan spray. So I reckon we're, we're possibly in a fair bit of trouble there. I don't mind the idea of maybe having to go to shielded sprays or cultivation in the row or something. We've got to look at something else there. And then as a final last throw of herbicide, with all the other things coming along behind it, we can spray top some of the crops that we grow uh, if that timing works, if they haven't already matured and dropped seed on the ground. So getting to the, the harvest end of our crops is pretty difficult. Really, if we're going to blow out before then, we should be putting it in a bale or down the throat of a cow or something. Uh, just the nature of our weeds. I've frozen. All right, we're good. Just some of the things like I said before you get a new product you have a crack at it see how, how it works and how it fits in your system this is some of the early days with Atlantis went in early on the label timing and and sat all that oats down probably it was a you know I don't know a bit dry or a bit cold obviously they're the two things that'll bring it undone and then as someone mentioned earlier a late rain so that's the one we didn't spray they're all the ones we did that sat right down but then still just poked a little head up when we couldn't do anything about it towards the end and dropped a bit of seed we found that it's just critical to get the weather conditions and the growth right for that product and the other group Bs. Otherwise we belt the crop and we don't kill the weed. So we're, we're really quite pedantic now about watching those jobs get done as best as possible and quite often the best job is you know, not long ago, like the end of July, early August, um, if we get a warm week, particularly after rain. The other tactics to stop that seed set with our winter grass complex, the non-herbicide ones, winter fallow and then take out those emerged weeds somehow. 
We just didn't get them up this year. Uh, or where we did, they died again, so that was good. In crop, uh, Brad's going to talk tomorrow about the potential use of inter row cultivation. We should be bailing areas of blowouts and problem areas. We're probably not doing enough of that. And hand pulling and chipping, we've got a few growers that, that really get stuck in with their labour and ride paddocks and chip and pull, and it's, it's really made a difference both in the summer fallow and in the winter crop, where there's not just the wrong amount of weeds to spray economically, but at the wrong timing, uh, etc. Right, I can see a few of you nodding off, so I'll get cracking. Here we go. Summer problems, ornus, barnyard, liver seed and feather top. The residuals really take pressure. We talked about, uh, Longy talked about double knocks before, and if you're trying to get across 10,000 hectares of summer fallow in 10 days before the next rain, really, really hard. So trying to get a quarter, a third, or half your, your summer fallow country down with residuals so it doesn't have to be double knocked, or it might just get sprayed once. Um, that can work really good if you've got a fixed rotation, but you know, like years like this and a, and a big tick pea price can unravel that. A lot of the products we're using there are, are the Immies, um, Jewel Gold, Stomp, Valor. A bit of help from some of these triazines and others, Balance, quite handy. Um, really, the time of year to do that's now. So we've got rain coming potentially this weekend. We should be putting our, our residuals down now. It's August is feather top roads and flea bone month, basically, for our spring germination. And then it's also looking at what you do in the existing winter crop to stop that germination pre-harvest. Um, chip or chop, cultivation. In cotton we've got, we've been way too heavily reliant on this Roundup Ready Flex scenario, but we, we can use Group A, shielded sprays in a row. Um, and thankfully, Syngenta and Monsanto have, have bound together this year to incentivise growers to do more with the residuals and more with non glyphosate products, which is really, really good. Um, that's just a picture where I ride around a fair bit through our paddocks and, and this is barnyard grass. So we've done a double knock in this paddock. We've killed all the barnyard grass and this is all the feather top that was left behind. And just knocking out that patch now stops that being, you know, this size patch um, next season. We talked about stubble height and shading. I don't know why we don't have a lot more 25 centimetre spaced nozzles on our burns when we've got rows that are narrower than our 50 metre nozzle spacing. Just trying to get product in down here is really hard. Killed the big exposed plant but missed the little blokes that were tucked in. And we've talked about what can happen if, if things get away. It just becomes extremely ugly. Um, application equipment, full boom, camera activated, long covered, aerial. You know, sometimes if we've got country with red ridges, we might actually put the plane over those red ridges to take out button grass and liver seed before we can get a ground rig on the heavy soil. Um, we're trying to always spray those small, fresh weeds. Uh, we talked about that. Timing of double knot, plenty of work being done there by NGA. On grasses, I tend to favour that two to five days. Flea bone, seven to 12. We're having a big rethink and we've had our arguments and I think we're moving into it now, this water volume for our desiccant sprays. We've got to rethink logistics. Again, I talked about a hay baler or residual sprays before. We're almost talking about ploughing again or putting 200 litres on in some cases or 150 litres. And when you talk about it that way, it's a lot more attractive to go and put another tank or a water cart somewhere than go and plough up country and start missing crops again and finding out how much fuel costs. So we're actually looking at putting more water on farms to be able to do that double knock, if it's a herbicide double knock, uh, with a much greater volume and getting a better job. I'll show you a few pickies of that. Quite often our first spray is a glyphosate based program, group A, may have some residuals in it. It nearly never has it, uh, group I's in it because of the antagonism. We make sure that water is spot on. We treat all our water up to a, to a level to make sure it's good. Uh, and then our double knock quite often is a paraquat based spray. It could also be a, a mechanical or some other form, but if it's, a, if it's a herbicide, it's a paraquat. And quite often it'll have either a group G or another uh, residual that we want to get down on that paddock in there as well. Righto.
as was mentioned before, we're trying to kill all the weeds with both sprays. We're not saying, oh, we'll have a bit of a crack here and we'll sort of have another crack there. We are trying, unless it's a, a full-on grass paddock and there's a few flea bone in there, well, yeah, we're not targeting them with, with a group eye, but we are trying to do the best job we can with both of those sprays. Some of the work we've done lately is just to, um, you know, some of the, the talk that's around, what have we lost glypho, what have we lost paraquat, what other products have we got that we can use while we're learning to adapt to less and less herbicide if, if necessary. Um, what happens if we've got a dry lamb wheat stubble that's got three cotton paddocks around it and we've got flea bone and grass in there, what do you do? Um, that block on the left we used a paratrooper brew, so that's paraquat amitrol, 2.4 litres, 1% hasten oil, 200 litres per hectare volume, took a bit of talking into, we just did one spray. So instead of doing a spray on three different winds each time, we just did one spray. Uh, that went down with some residuals. We sprayed that in November and we didn't touch that paddock again until March. Um, we killed upright flea bone. If you could zoom in, you'd see there's just a little green branch on that fella there and another bit there. I don't know what it is about that sniff of Amitrol, but maybe it was the residuals we had in there as well. But that brew has worked well to suppress uh, both grass and, and flea bone. Uh, the, the spray on the right there was a, a paraquat sharpen, so we've been doing a bit of that work as well. Some of the Group Gs are, are working really well with paraquat as well as glypho, but nearly always at high volume with oil. Um, handy on the broadies not quite as strong on the grasses. Hello. We talked about what could be coming into the valley. We had a tea at the cotton conference with Graham Charles last week and he talked about hay and grain coming from WA and I said, hang on mate, what about what's coming in the flood when it turns up? We'll have weeds coming down from the hills as well. So we've got plenty more in front of us. We won't be out of the job for a while. Um, we haven't had the winter emergence that we really looked for in the break this year. We had a shocking, I felt like a first year agronomist after 20 odd years with the, the split of crop stage that we had in the winter crop this year, trying to manage that. We're sometimes impeded by the cost of that new technology and equipment. We look at it and go, right, oh, Shelbourne front looks great. Oh, but hang on, we've got to adjust the planter as well. I like that. You don't want to just do one in isolation, though. That's, that's good information. Um, this one I'm pretty passionate about, getting that water quality right, making sure we get the best value out of our products. We've probably, in some cases this year, erred on the, on the side of crop safety, of actually getting some grain to harvest instead of spraying a few areas. Um, at this stage it looks like we may not get the crop or the weeds through the seed set, so that's probably going to work out alright. Um, and I guess the biggest one will be the, our restriction of or loss of actives if they just don't work anymore. And I guess the other thing that's out there is um, if someone can just get on the wavelength of the people that think that's how your milkshakes are made and, and maybe get some science to them and help them understand what's really going on in agriculture, I reckon that'd be awesome. Because um, there's so much misinformation out there, it's, it's really uh, an impediment to progress. We, um, we as a group are all off the one hymn sheet here today, like it's, it's fantastic that we're all heading in the same direction but we've just got to get that message out effectively. We're actually a minority group in this country now so we're allowed to be vocal. You can get out there and have a yarn to your locals and, uh, and see how you go with it. I think that's all. Oh, a couple of key points, there you go. We could be living in a brief herbicide age. I only really thought about that in the last month or two. So we've got, I was really panicking when things started not working, but we've just got to go with it and work out the best way to do it, and this is the best forum to do it as well. Share ideas and share innovations. Um, the rest of those we can, we can see as you go through. There is plenty of room for innovation. And it's been a challenging year, but it's great to get together at these sort of forums. Thank you.